My name is Gregory Cox, and also I am the author of the book Promising the Moon, Going the Distance, a book where I wrote and I talked about my process of recovery as well as my process of having addictive behaviors and addictive attitudes and things like that. L let me go back some and say that my father was an alcoholic, my older brother had a problem with, alco with alcoholism, my older sister had a problem with alcoholism, and I'm the third to the oldest. And so I fell in suit. And so I began to use at an early age and I became addicted. I'm healed enough or healthy enough to say that I neglected some things using, right? Uh, addiction had allowed me to ne neglect some of my personal responsibilities such as parenting. I remember going to treatment in March of 91 and, and this was after my children was removed from me because of my addiction. So my children was removed from me and, and my child's mother because of addiction. And I remember going uh, to the store to hustle for some nickels and dimes to get me a, a, a pint of wine because that was the first thing in the morning. I would get me a pint of wine and then I would go and try to uh, hustle up money to get some drugs. And one of my children came up to me that morning before he went to school and he asked me for some nickels and dimes. He asked me for some change and I told him I didn't have it. I had to change, but I didn't give it to him because any change for someone who was an alcoholic and an addict, that was the sound of the next drug or the next pint of wine. And so I didn't give it to him. He walked away with his head down. That picture stayed with me. A week later, I went to treatment. And that was March of 91. And I went to treatment and I found myself in a 30-day treatment. And then after the 30-day treatment, I went to... Uh, a longer term program which was 18 months and I began to make meetings Alcoholic Anonymous NA meetings and the 12 step fellowship and I began to recover one day at a time and uh, as a result of that I regained custody of my children and I'm saying I'm excited to say that uh, even though my children was in child welfare it was the recovery community that helped me continue to uh, to know that I can be a parent I can parent in recovery. I can be the father that I am today. And I want to talk about that later in terms of what I'm doing as it relates to fathers in recovery. But it was the 12 step fellowship members that was in, in the 12 step room. They was in the program and we was talking about families. They was going back to school and getting degrees. And you had members who had lost their children and lost their families they had begun to go back home and begin to use the process of principles and the process of the 12 steps and the process that they received from the treatment center in order to better themselves, but to also in order to better their families. Because one of the things I found out is that uh, not only addiction is, is an individual problem, but we also know addiction also affect our family and our community, right? And so when we, when I came into the field of substance abuse or substance use, um, we was focusing more on the individual. But now we're focusing more on the family and recovery uh, because that individual, they go to treatment, they get out of treatment, they go to outpatient, they go to intensive outpatient, but they have to go back to the community. They have to go back to their families. And so we have to begin to make sure that we helping the family uh, recover as well as the individual. As a result of me getting sober, as a result of me getting clean, I, uh, I've been in the field since 1992. I've been in the recovery field doing some outreach work, um, working with families who's involved in child welfare. And so I'm excited that I have the opportunity now to give back, right? It's, it's like the opportunity to give back to the community of people where I once damaged because of my substance abuse. I am now the fatherhood coordinator for Children Home and Aid. And, uh, and that's exciting for number one is because we are developing a fatherhood coalition on the west side of Chicago. And then also I'm aware that there's a fatherhood coalition here in yes. McLean County. And so we're doing some great things because the goal is to continue to help other systems begin to not only talk about fatherhood, but also talk about and develop programs where fathers can be um, uh, counted and to be heard 
and to also uh, be seen as someone who are someone who are invested in the family and someone who can be counted on even those fathers in recovery those fathers who have dropped the ball but did whatever they need to do in order to make things different you know i was asked the question what do it look like when we talk about restoring the family in recovery well for me my children was in in they was in foster care and they was in child welfare and so i had to attend visits i had to attend supervised scheduled visits on a weekly basis and what that was doing it was building the relationship with me and the, and the children's right and so i had to continue to do unsupervised visits while i was in the, the transitional program because i'm recovering but I had to build a relationship with the children who was in foster care. And the reason, let me go back to make sure that you guys understand, the reason that they was in foster care is because of addiction. And so I had to begin to prove myself, right? Because for so many times, uh, I can make a promise, but wouldn't deliver on the promise. And so if you have an idea, if you ask the question, where did the title of the book come from? That's exactly where the title of the book come from. I would make them promises, but I wouldn't, I, would not deliver on the promise. And so I had to learn how to have a, a healthy, sober relationship with my children. And that went on for about six months or so. I had to have supervised visits. And then from supervised visits, it was uh, unsupervised visits. And uh, I would be able to go pick my children up, keep them for two hours. Then I would take them back to the foster parent home. That went on for about uh, three to six months and then they gave me overnight. Reason why I'm saying this is because I'm showing you that there was a process of building a relationship with my children. And not only that, I had to learn how to be a father in recovery. And then so about a year later, they gave me custody of three of my children. So I was a single father in recovery with three boys and the oldest was 10 and the youngest was uh, six. And so I had to learn how to parent in recovery. I had to learn how to uh, wake the kids up, cook them breakfast, take them to school, take them to the doctor's office. It's all of the things that I neglected as a parent because of the substance abuse, all of that, I had to rewind and I had to uh, learn how to be a responsible, productive father in the society that I was living in with my children. And it was, uh, some days was better than others. Some days was easier than others. But I want to say this, the help that I received from the recovery community was amazing. Uh, when we talk about concrete support, that group of people was the group that helped me uh, strengthen myself. They helped me uh, have the confidence in myself, the confidence in my recovery that I needed. It was those members that I can go to a group and tell them exactly how I was feeling and everything that was going on with me. And that group of individual encouraged me. Uh, they inspire me. They continue to say, hey, look, you can do this one day at a time. I would definitely recommend that if you're doing anything as it relates to trying to recover your family, it's going to be important to have a support system. It's going to be important to have someone that's going to support you and support what you're doing. Uh, because there were times where I wanted to quit. I wanted to give in, and I thanked them for that. And so as a result of that, I didn't give up and I didn't give in. One of the things I did too is I made sure that my children had counseling. We had family counseling, I had individual counseling, and then they had counseling for themselves. Why? Because there was a lot of damage that was done with the abandonment, the, the trauma, the hurt, all of that. That was uh, that needs to be addressed, and, and so I would definitely, um, at this point now in my recovery, I am an advocate for counseling. Anyone who's moving forward and doing some great things as it relates to your family, and you are in recovery, uh, and it may be you in your first stage of recovery, uh, or if you are in long-term recovery, I would suggest to make sure that you are getting some help for yourself and for your family. The challenging thing for me was money and transportation. I needed to get around. Got my first job in in recovery because I was on the streets. I was hustling, stealing, taking, and so I was aware that I needed to I needed to have some money. And so for me, the hardest thing is that I wasn't getting enough money that I thought I needed. And so I 
to start working a part-time job, start getting some money, and realize even with the part-time job, it was a lot of money because I wasn't using it and I wasn't wasting it. Mm. And so even the part-time job, and it was, this was minimum wage, we talking 92. Minimum wage was, I think it was $3, yeah. Yeah, four five, three, yeah. yeah. Three fifty, three seventy five, five dollars, and so, but it was enough money for me, because the number one, I wasn't wasting it. I didn't know how to drive. I came into recovery. I was twenty eight. Didn't know how to drive, and so everywhere I would go, it would be public transportation. I would use public transportation, and then I get custody of two more of my childrens. Made it five out of the eight that was in child welfare, and so um, I knew that I needed to have some type of transportation to get them back and forth to their appointments, as well as to uh, get me to my meetings, because that was the support system. I made sure that the meetings was built around my life. Everything I did, either I had to go to a meeting first, or I went to a meeting afterwards. Uh, if I went to meet, if I worked at 12 noon, I went to a 10 o'clock meeting, left the meeting and went to work. If I got off at 5 p.m., after I went home, if I changed clothes, I went to a meeting. And so I made sure that the support system was around me, whatever I did, whether it was in the morning or at night. Um, and I listened to some of the people in the meeting. They said, hey, look, why don't you go drive a at school? Go let somebody teach you how to drive, get you a vehicle. I did just that. And I learned how to drive and bought me a vehicle. Uh, so I'm one of those that uh, didn't get so good. I taught my wife how to drive later on, but we got married and we raised a family in recovery together. The recovery community helped, and that's what I needed. I needed that. Yeah. It's, it, my, my recovery looks different now because, because I know that there's different avenues for recovery. When I came around in recovery, it was total abstinence. The, there was no other programs that we have now, or there was no other medical maintenance programs and things like that 31 years ago. Yeah. I'm not against any form of recovery because I just want someone to recover and change the course of their life. But I was making three to four meetings a week, right, when I first came around because number one, I didn't want to use no more dope. And number two, they told me, change people, places, and things. And so I took that to heart, made meetings, didn't go around old peoples, I built new relationships and things like that. Well, now it looks different uh, because I have men's groups that I attend now. There's a church that I attend that's part of my process of recovery. I write, I read, I listen to YouTube videos and, and as it relates to recovery. And so there's a, a variety of things that I think that's helpful now in recovery that we didn't have years ago. I mean, I applaud the individual who came in recovery during COVID, no personal meetings. Um, I do attend in the rooms. There's a, there's a group, online group that I attend. So I, I still do take part in recovery. But I understand now that there's multiple strategies that I can use or support processes that I can use to sustain my, my process of recovery now. I'm not one to uh, downplay or to have a negative impact on any of it because it's 30 years later. Uh, I'm different after 30 years. Things are done different now, right? And so uh, I cannot assume that someone process for recovery is gonna take place the same way mine did. And, and so I understand that. When we talk about the different method and the different ways for someone to recover, I've seen someone go to church and went to altar and never use again. So, so, so there are different ways and different methods when we talk about recovery. Well, good question. Uh, they are all out of my home and they are taking care of their own family. They are raising their own children. Uh, one of them is a photographer. They spread it out. I have grandchildren now. They are doing life. And one of the things I am just excited about is that they're taking care of their kids. They are using what they, what they learned from me as a recovery. And all my children know about my process. They know about my recovery. And once again, it's in the book. And I talked about that whole process. And so I'm excited about what they're doing as, as young adults. And, and, and some of them I can see the beginning of alcoholism, but I'm not telling them, you know, I just tell them what I did. You know, I let, I let them know what I did. I can't call them an alcoholic. I can't call them an addict. That's an admission they have to make for themselves, right? Uh, what do I see in terms of spirituality? 
how I identify spirituality, spirituality is, is, is me not thinking less of myself but me thinking of myself less. That's what spirituality is for me. Because for me, it was more about me, 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 me. When, when we grow spiritually, it, it's about getting out of ourselves and helping someone else, right? Uh, I always grow up as the, in the religious community, right? And, but when I grew up, it was about a punishing God. If you do this, God's going to get you. If you do that, God's going to get you. If you don't do that, God's going to get you. It's like, okay, if you hang with them, God's going to get you. And so it was like, okay, whatever I do, I'm going to hell. Then, okay, all my friends is doing the same thing. We're going to be in hell together. One of the things I like about the 12-step program is that it allowed me to have a relationship with my higher power as I seem fit. And it wasn't a dictator. It wasn't dictated by anyone else. And so that's one of the great things about the 12-step program is that they allow us to choose the higher power that, that, that you feel that would benefit you in your process of recovery. And for me, at the beginning, my higher power was the group. It was a group of people, a group of drunks, who was coming to meeting. They were staying sober. They were staying clean from drugs. And they was talking about, I got six days clean. I got five days clean. Uh, that was a power greater than myself at the beginning for me. It was the group that was a power. It, it, it showed me that for number one, they had power to stay together. They had power to reunite themselves together. And so that was my first higher power when I first came into the process of recovery. And then through that process, I was able to identify who I wanted to call my higher power with my own choosing. I believe higher power is needed, but we have to understand and how to identify with a higher power. For me, it was a group of people who was changing the course of their life, who was going, going to school, getting jobs, saving money, getting kids back, going back home, learning how to drive. They was doing greater things than I had seen, a greater thing that I had done. And so for me, that was a great power that they would do and to see that and to experience it and witness it it was like wow I'm, I want that I'm attracted to that and so I began to to be attracted to their God their higher power because they would come in and say my higher power helped me get a job I'm like whoa my higher power helped me go to school my high, and so it was like okay so when I think about spirituality and higher power everything is not centered around me now before I got sober it was about me mine this is mine it was so much about me that I neglected my parental responsibility to my children. But then when I regained custody of the children, it was more about them. I remember moving away from the shelter that I was in with my children and moving into my own apartment. And I had a part-time job, and I, but my money ran out before the month ran out. I don't know, y'all probably, that probably had never happened to y'all. Y'all probably, probably, <laughs> probably never had that happen to you. But my money ran out before the month ran out. And I went to the meetings. That's what I knew to do. And, uh, and I told them that I was struggling because not only did I go to the meetings, but my three boys was in the meetings with me. They had to come to the meetings with me because there was nowhere else for them to go. I was a single father. I told the group I didn't have no money. I had no food in the house. Uh, some of the members came up, gave me money. But there was this one guy, he came up, he said, uh, you know, where you stay at, there's a church in your community. They give away food, bag, food bags every week on Wednesday. So you need to take your ego and get rid of it and go down to that church and ask that church for some food for you and your boys. Mm -hmm. And so I did just that. Why? Because it wasn't about me anymore. It was about making sure that the needs of the entire family was met. And at the time it was food. And I was grateful for that support system to be able to tell me that, hey, look, so what they introduced me to was resources in the community. Now, before recovery, I'm taken from the community. But in recovery, I had to learn how to use the resources in the community to help me parent my children. It was a community, it was a community effort. We had coloring books, depending on where we was at. A lot of time we was in a church, church basement, so we was in a church setting. Uh, members would bring books for the kids. And of course it was a no profanity meetings, because let me say that too, because some meetings, they just let it ride. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the community of the people who welcomed my children, right? Because everybody knew me. Greg with, Greg with, the, three, with the three boys. 
So it was almost like, okay, you when you say, hey, Greg, you, you put the, the three boys behind it. And so what I learned is that I always had wanted to be part of a group that was thriving, that was doing some, a group of kids, whatever they was doing, I always wanted to be part of the group, and I always was. And so being part of a group that cared more about me and my family, it was amazing because there were times, too, where someone, sometimes they got the kids, left out of the meeting, if I had a moment where I needed to really share and then bring the kids back. And so it was a great support. And so if anyone who's recovering and you're struggling with, okay, what can I do with my kids? Then keep in mind, those kids are in a process of recovery as well. And we need to make sure that we find them some help. Uh, Alateen, Alanon, we need to make sure that those other avenues and resources is available to the whole entire family. Not only do the individual recover, but also the entire family recovery. And we need to make sure that the family have the resources in order for them to recover as well and to, uh, and to not try to control their process of recovery. Right, just because I'm recovering a certain way, that does not mean that you have to recover the same way I recover. There's another avenue for you. Not, number one, what I, one of the things I didn't do is I didn't promise my kids anything. When I was in treatment and I was seeing them weekly visits, I didn't promise them anything. They asked me, Dad, when are we going to come home? I said, uh, I'm getting better. It's going to be a day at a time. And so I think one of the things is to start doing small things to build a relationship. I spoke to a group of men this past Monday. And some of them talked about, um, I haven't seen my kid in some years and I'm in recovery now and I want to begin to see my kids. I say, start off small. Call them once a week. Don't promise them anything. Just say, hey, how you doing? I just, you don't have to talk long. It's creating an atmosphere of building a relationship first. And how do you do that? You can do it different ways. Calling you, hey, how you doing? Texting you and just say, I, I was just thinking about you, wondering how you doing. If the other parent is involved in keeping the child away from them, build a relationship with the other parent. Because it's not about you, it's about you trying to encourage them to help you build a relationship with your child. Because sometimes the, the, the breakup or the separation didn't go well, but it comes with time and maturity. That are you matured enough to say, hey look, I was wrong. Can we build a relationship now so that I can begin to build a relationship with my daughter, with my son? It, sometimes it's about you get to a point where you matured enough to be able to admit complete defeat. I was wrong. It wasn't fair. You didn't deserve it. Please forgive me. And in that process of forgiveness, I would love to learn how to have a relationship with you and have a relationship with my kid. That's pretty deep, ain't it? I, I think what they do is set the atmosphere for someone not to be on the defensive mode because I'm saying right away I was wrong. And, and, and when you get to a point in recovery, you, you, you mature to a point where as though you can literally say that because you're aware of the damage that addiction, alcoholism, or drug addiction cause and the damage that you cause others, you can get to a point to say that. I've taken a fourth step. I did an inventory. I know my behavior, my shortcomings, my defective characters and things like that. And so, and so as a result of that, I can say, hey, look, you know, that was my fault. You, you didn't deserve that. That wasn't fair to you. you. You deserve a father to be at home with you, to take care of you, to go to the games, and I didn't do it, and that wasn't fair. Would you forgive me? Right? And, and that's what we want to do because we want to set the atmosphere for them to open up, to say, hey, look, yeah, you was wrong, man. You know, I, you, I, you know, you was wrong for that. That wasn't fair. You shouldn't have did that. Beep, beep. You know, some other stuff may come behind that too, right? You know cussing and all that other stuff. But yeah, those are the things I, I would say to someone who is either in early recovery is to take your time. First of all, if you're in early stage of recovery and you're trying to regain custody of your children's and you've been getting high for 15 years and you just clean 30 days, take your time. Get some sobriety under your belt. Take your time because you're not going to be able to mend in 30 days what took you 15 years to break. And so you have to take your time and you have to sustain and you have to get some recovery under your belt. That's gonna be important because the people that you hurt it, a day, two days, 30 days clean, it, it, it doesn't balance out. And I wanna say something for those people that, that think that, the, that a program, a 12 step program don't work, I wanna say this real quick. If you've been using 15 years and you got clean for six months and you go back out and you use again and you relapse or you, you have a slip, setback and then you say the program don't work 
how about you give the program the same amount of time that you used? If you use 15 years, give the program 15 years before you make a decision say the program don't work. Because if you don't, then you're not balancing it right. Give the program, the recovery process, the same amount of time that you that we gave the streets or that we gave our addiction. So in, in closing, I want to invite you to purchase the book. The book is Promised in the Moon, Going the Distance, the book that I wrote and I talked about all of my personal stories, my challenges as a teen father, my challenges as it relates to addiction, as well as my process of recovery. I'm excited I wrote this book about three years ago. It's been getting great reviews. Uh, this book have also been used in uh, Southern Illinois University as part of the social work process. So please go to doingfamily.org, purchase the book. It's also on Amazon, get you a copy as well as there's a workbook that goes along with it as well. I'm also on social media platforms, uh, Instagram as GregC63. I'm also on LinkedIn as well as Facebook as Gregory Cox. So thank you. Thank you.